Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I am your host. I'm delighted to have with me today Ms. Webley Alfred. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Webley. She's an online social media strategist and really web designer guru. So, Webley, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Oh, thank you, Bertine. I am so so happy to be with you today. Um, it's such an honor. Um, when I got your email about this opportunity, I was jumping because I'm like, wow, this is, um, I was thinking about it, but I didn't know that it was going to be you. So thank you so much for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. This is definitely um, something I was looking forward to. So thank you for giving so freely of your time. I appreciate you. And I'm going to tell our audience a little bit about you. So after graduating from Boston University, magna cum laude, might I add, with a degree in computer science, you began your career as a software analyst at MIT. Being that you were a passionate self-learner and, and self-admitted geek, <laughs> you then worked for the University of Massachusetts Medical School as a web developer. In 2007, you formed Webley Alfred Design to help small business owners launch their businesses um, online like pros while creating the businesses and the lives that they deserve. So Webley, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. But thank you for having me. <laughs> so now I want to I wanted you to just um because I just told our listeners a little bit about you, but tell us a little bit more about you. What do you want them to know about Webley and who she is? <laughs> Well, number one, I want um, your audience to know that, um, well, the first, the most important role for me, I'm a mom to an amazing 11-year-old um, boy, <laughs> and um, I'm 100% Haitian. <laughs> Sac passe. <laughs> That's what we all our Haitian listeners out there and those who love Haitians. <laughs> yes, um, I'm 100% Haitian. And um, I moved to Massachusetts really for education because um, you know, growing up, I remember as a teenager, my aunt, she was visiting in Haiti and she brought, you know, several pamphlets from universities and um, MIT, BU and others were part of the um, pile of pamphlets she brought to me. And I remember I zero in on BU and MIT. And needless to say that um, they told me that I was crazy. Um, I didn't know because I was just, you know, dreaming. I was dreaming big as a little girl. So, um, you know, I'm a dreamer. So with that said, I'm a dreamer and um, I am a firm believer of um, helping other people get what they want because um, that it's fulfilling to put a smile on somebody's face and to help them achieve their goal. And to me, I believe that is the only way to get what you want by helping other people get what they want. Um, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, <laughs> and uh, I am a fellow entrepreneur. I love helping entrepreneurs um, reach their goal. I love helping them 
go through the tech stuff because I know that is a tech form. I've went through that myself. So this has become a passion for me over the years in helping other entrepreneurs, um, especially entrepreneurs who don't know about this whole online um, um, industry world. Um, it's still very new for a lot of people. So um, I'm the geek, yes. <laughs> Love it. And you guys can't see this right now um, for those listening, um, but she is a fabulous geek. So <laughs> she is a fabulous geek. So like I said, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show today because I, I first um, just love what you represent, right? Um, um, you represent so many different things um, from the diversity and inclusion perspective. You represent, um, you know, the journey and, and the success story of the immigrant, right? Yes. And then you represent um, women and particularly women of color in the tech industry, which is something I want to definitely discuss with you. You represent mompreneurs because like you, I'm the parent of a young son um, who happens to be 10. He is amazing, but at the same <laughs> time, he is my boss <laughs> when I'm doing so many things. So although we can be the CEOs of our lives, our businesses and our dreams, um, our kids, I feel, are uh, kind of the, the major bosses in that because a part of why we did that um, was for them to create a legacy, right? Um, exactly. Our internal drive as well, but we want to leave a legacy for them. And, and I think it's important, especially as moms of boys, to, to have them see that women can right? And yeah. that to me is a strong motivator. And I know that resonates with you as well. So um, being that you are Haitian, um, as, as am I, <laughs> I want to, um, I really love your story because your story resonates with, with so many women out there, immigrant people in general, but women out there who were raised in a culture to either be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or marry one. I, I always say um, I, was, I was prepped for law school. I was bred for law school. And then I realized I didn't want to do that. And then I said, you know, with my Haitian relatives, I'm like, well, I married an engineer. So technically, do I get a check mark on the box? I don't know. <laughs> You know, because everybody looked at me, um, except my mom, who always, always, um, although she was raised in a traditional environment, she was a modern woman for her time. And she always, always believed in whatever I wanted to do, as long as I educated myself, right? Because that is something no one can take away from you. So that, that cultural anchor um, that, that we had as Haitian women growing up to be a specific thing, right? Um, that is, that is our cultures are beautiful and wonderful, but that is burdensome, right? And it is confusing yes. for those who yes. do not understand it. So talk to me about your journey um, once you saw those BUMIT brochures, because that to me said already something that set you apart from, from what culturally you were intended to be, right? So talk uh -huh. to me about how that, how that came about. Well, um, as a young girl growing up in Haiti, um, for me, growing up, the only, my mom and my dad, they are business owners mm -hmm. in Haiti. So I didn't really have um, the example of anyone in my family going to college in the States or doing anything like that. So that wasn't something that at first as a, a young girl that I wanted, that I was aiming for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mothers, mothers, God bless moms. <laughs> My mom, she went along with a lot of crazy stuff that I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how to play the piano. She went along with it. I wanted to do ballet. She went along with it. She went along with everything and spent money. I think I owe her a lot of money by now. <laughs> but um, so part of my dreaming in not giving up I, I have to credit my mom for that because when I would come to her with my crazy ideas, and in this case, I came to her with my idea of going to BU and MIT, and she, I remember her looking at me and saying, well, I don't have the money for that, but if that's what you want, then go for it. <laughs> I love it. So you she know, a challenge. She was saying, yeah, she gave me a challenge, but little did I know back then that this is what this was something that I was putting out in the universe. This is something that I was, I started to align everything that was coming in my future to position myself to actually, um, you know, be 
to actually be involved in MIT or be involved in BU some way, shape or form, but I had no idea how. All I know was that I wanted to go to these schools. That's about it. Yeah. Um, so I graduated high school and I went to one of the top, actually the th- top at the time, secretarial school, Christ the King Secretarial School in Haiti. I know of that school. <laughs> yes. <right there. laughs> yes. Um, I went to that school and here's the funny part. I took the exam and they only accept 30 students at the time when I was doing it. Wow. They only accept 30 students. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but before that, when I, you know, the national um, exam you take, is, which is kind of similar to MCAS mm-hmm. here. So when I took the Haitian MCAS, <laughs> and um, so I finished top 10, national top 10. So I had the highest grade, the top 10. And can and, I just interject for a second, just so yes. our listeners who are not Haitian or, or born here like I was, um, but raised Haitian, just for those that aren't familiar with the criteria that you had to deal with, um, the challenge, um, they accept one in 30, Christ the King, but we're talking about out of thousands of people that would want to apply to a place like this, right? So we're talking about a huge amount of people that want to apply and a very, less than 1%, we can say, of people get into that school. So, exactly. Yeah, just exactly. to give us some context as to what, <laughs> how difficult that is. And then once you're in there, the rigors of it. Exactly. So mm-hmm. I, I went in, I took the exam, I got the phone call that I was accepted. Mm-hmm. And I turned it down. You turned it down. I feel I like turned it down. Kind of music. <laughs> I turned it down because I also had a full scholarship. Because when I took the Haitian MCAS, mm-hmm. I was top ten. And when you're top ten, you can pick any college you wanted to go to. Sure, sure. And it was a full ride. So mm-hmm. I picked medical school. So I turned down Christ the King Secretarial School to go to medical school. Wow. So I went to medical school, sat in the class for one day. And right then and there, I said to myself, this is not for me. Wow. I don't want to be a doctor. I know that this is what my parents would love because it was either doctor, lawyer, or civil engineer. So I, so I forgot about, I said, I'm not doing it. I went home. I said to my mom, this is not for me. Right. So now... I had to call Christ the King and beg them to take me back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I called them and begged them to take me back. So they said, you know what? You had one of the top scores. We will take you back, but you have to commit to finish the two years. You can't after a year. What I'm hearing is another challenge, right? (laughs) Another challenge. Exactly. So, so, um, Sister Judith at the time was in charge and um, she said, you have to commit to staying because you already said no um, because you were pursuing something else. And then now you coming back begging for that spot. Do you know how many people would die to be in your place right now? Yeah. And so here I am, I had a, scho- a, full ride, a full scholarship ride that I gave up. And this one, I was gonna pay, I was gonna have to convince my parents to pay for it. So the other one was free. This one, they're going to pay for it monthly because it's a private school. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went along with it because I, I said to myself, you know what? The typical, um, the expectation for a lot of Haitian girls is like you finish high school and even when you want to pursue something for yourself, but the ultimate accomplishment is to get married. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, to get married and have kids. So, me, that became another challenge. I said, well, I'm going to go to the secretary of school so that I can start working. After two years, I'm going to start working and I'm going to be independent. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I did that, graduated, and then worked on a project um, in a, one of the, the, minister, the Ministry of Transportation in Haiti. I worked in a project. That, they had a small project with some French consultant. I worked on that project for six months. And then after six months, I said, this is not for me. This nine to five thing is not for me. Mm-hmm. I quit. <laughs> this is sounding so familiar to me for so many reasons, just a different country, but I get you. I get yes. you. So Wait, and I, I want to point out that takes courage. That takes courage and it takes a certain drive that I really, because everything in your culture is telling you not to do that, right? 
and you're, you're faced with these challenges one right after another. And so you're essentially, you're walking into the wind because the wind is pushing you in one direction and you're like, no, I'm going to go the other way. So that pioneering spirit is something that I love to see in women. And I know that's how that landed you into the tech world. It did. It did. Because I remember after I quit this job, it was around December. And I specifically remember on December 24th, I'm praying and I'm like, God, there's got to be more to life than this. I don't want to be. I'm not the typical Haitian wife. I'm not. I didn't have these things in me. I wanted more. I said, there's, there's got to be more out there. So a friend of mine was working at a travel agency and I said to her, you know what? I always wanted to go to Florida for a weekend for shopping. Um, I have money. I'm going to go shopping. Get me a ticket. 22 years later, I'm still in the United States. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. That's a good turn. I thought you were going to say something like, well, you know, after that weekend, it changed my life and I came back. You just, you just stayed. <laughs> I, after that weekend, I never looked back and it was just something different. But I have to thank the women in my family because I have my, my aunt. I was staying with my aunt in Florida. Um, she's, she's a brilliant, um, you know, nurse practitioner and also an artist. She sings, she's a writer. And she told me, she said, if you want more in life, this is it for you here. The land of opportunities, this is it. She said, there's nothing left for you in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but I want to give back. She said, well, if you want to give back, you got to get yourself up first. That's so and then turn around and give back. If you have nothing to give, how are you going to benefit anyone? So she really encouraged me to stay because I was kind of nervous. My mom was panicking. My mom was losing it. She said, what? I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, no, no. I said, mom, I want to do this. This is the land of opportunities. I'm going for my opportunity. So fast forward from Florida, I moved to Boston. And when I moved to Boston and, you know, going to Cambridge and I'm like, oh my God, this is the Harvard that I see on TV all the time. Um, this is MIT. This is this, this is, you know, and I was like, yes, this is my chance. But, you know, Bertine, when you make those, when you're dreaming like that, you have so many, um, you also, the same way you position the universe to work with you, to make those things happen. It's the same way too that you get the attention of people who tend to project their own fears on you. Oh, so, that's so true. Right when I made that decision, these are the things that I started hearing from family members who they met well, but I think that it's because they never, something they've never done themselves. So they were projecting that uncertainty on me, that fear on me. They said, you not, and I heard things like, you want to go to BU and MIT? No, um, they don't accept. You're not going to get there with uh, high school grades from Haiti. That's not going to happen. I said, well, I want to work as an administrative assistant with what I learned from, from the Christ the King Secretary of School. They told me, no, anything you want to do here, you have to get the education here. So everything you did in Haiti, scratch that. It was a waste of time. So here it's different. You got to start over. Again, another challenge. And another I said, challenge, no, 
this has got to be different. And I remember um, I was working a part-time job because I'm still trying to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. And I met a gentleman, we were having lunch, an older person, and I was telling him my dreams. And he said, baby girl, I don't know anything about that stuff, but if you want to know, I suggest you go to BU, you go to MIT and you ask them, let them reject you, let them say no, then you will figure something out. So that's what I did. You know, I went to BU, got the information, and they told me I need some credit, but I couldn't afford it. Guess what? I started in a community college. I started at Bunker Hill Community College. And there you go again, people projecting their fears on me. They're like, oh, um, only immigrants go to Bunker Hill Community College, or only people that um, they're not going to go that far. Those are the people that go to Bunker Hill Community College. But what this person didn't know was that I had already consulted with BU and asked them, I said, if I go to Bunker Hill Community College and I score very high, are you going to accept my credit? It's like, yeah, we will. You know, so I knew, I knew from the get go that let me ask at the source, let me find out for myself. So again, I had a tunnel vision. I decided to do it. So when I graduated from Bunker Hill Community College, fast forward, graduated Bunker Hill Community College with honors, I transferred to BU. And by that time, I was no longer working as an assistant. And I transferred to work at um, MIT. Wow. And while working at MIT, you know, they had a great tuition reimbursement program. Yes, they and, do. <laughs> and I was working in the math department, which is like, you know, second nature to me. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, unofficially, I attended some courses at MIT because when I was um, going to BU and I was doing classes like finite math, um, you know, it was so complex. And I was working with professors at MIT that weren't teaching this stuff. And I was asking them for help with my homework. And I remember at least three of the professors told me, listen, if you want to come and sit in my class, to understand this thing better, I teach this class, feel free to come. So here I am, I was sitting at MIT, you wow. know, learning, getting, you know, free tutoring <laughs> for math and learning finite math from people that were considered some of the top um, in the world. It was beyond my expectations. So at this point, I said, oh, God, you are delivering more than I expected. Um, fast forward, finished my education at BU. And the moment I was done at BU, I graduated magna cum laude. And then I started working right away as a software analyst at um, MIT. And it has been nothing but a great experience for me going to BU and I would love it if my son decides to go there too, but I'm not forcing anything on him. Um, and I have to say, one of the reasons that I picked BU was I wanted to do something technical. I wasn't sure what it was because very early on, I remember when they start, you know, you remember you got mail, AOL? Yes, yes. So when I, when I moved up here, I think two years later, back in 1999, um, yeah, back in 1999, we had the whole internet thing. And that's when a lot of institutions like banks, they were starting to add the internet service. It was very clunky, very clunky. And back at the time, a website was also a one HTML page and you had to code the whole oh thing. Oh my gosh. I know. It's so back there, the dark that, ages. <laughs> that's when, that's when I realized I want to do this. Because I was blown away by all this technical thing that I didn't understand anything about, but I knew it. I said, I want to know which one is the best school that will teach me about that. And the more I learned about BU, the more I decided this is the place for me. And I'm so happy I did that. But little did I know that it was going to come with the MIT package. Right. So uh, dreams do come true. <laughs> Gosh, I need to unpack some of this that you're laying on me here, Webley, because this is really a deep and profound journey that you took. And, and I want to just, this is what I'm taking away from this. So first, 
you went to not being sure of exactly what you wanted to do, which is what a lot of people go through, right? Um, yes. Whether you're an immigrant or not, but you had that, that um, added layer of complexity, which was the cultural perception and of what you could do, the cultural limitations that were placed upon you, particularly as a woman, right? Yes. And, and in a country that, you know, values women, but doesn't necessarily empower them to be who they need to be, right? And so having said that, so you, you went from not knowing, you went from all these cultural challenges that were placed upon you, but one thing I noticed is that you had a vision of being better than, whatever that was, right? Your vision of being better than. And yes. so by the time you, you got to, and by the time you got here, I saw some journeys of empowerment, right? First from your mom, then from your aunt, then from the gentleman who told you something as simple as go to be you and ask for yourself, right? That was somebody empowering you. And then when you got there, in addition to being empowered by the people at BU, you were empowered by the professors at MIT, right? That to me is astonishing too, because these people said, come audit my class, come sit here, right? Here's an opportunity. And I think that is a very powerful thing. Then not only do you get to be at BU, you get to be at MIT, but guess what you were doing? You were playing a part in representation. Yes. You and I have discussed offline that, you know, sometimes you'd be not only the, the only black person, but you'd be the only woman, right? And yes. then, you might be the only black woman immigrant, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about a trifecta of cultural richness yes. and challenges. And I love that because now people are going to see, and this is why diversity is so important, I think. People will see what, what they might have perceived as an other. They will now see that person and think, oh, this, this doesn't have to be a field of just one type of person, right? And, and it's important for not only young girls in particular to see that, because where there's representation, there's a model that can be established, right? But to be a trailblazer as you were, and as you continue to be, that in and of itself is, is huge. But I think not only does it empower young women, but it also empowers men, right? It empowers yes. them to open up um, their, their frame of thinking it empowers them to become allies in, in, uh, in true feminism, I think, which is saying that and, and believing and supporting that women can, right? And for me, that is what the feminist message is. Women can. And so that can be women can receive equal pay. Women can work in, in you know, executive jobs. Women can be entrepreneurs. Women can be moms and wives. Women can, period, right? Yeah, and let me add to that, mm -hmm. that women can even when you see at the beginning that you are traveling alone. It mm -hmm. looks like you're traveling alone. And I, and I feel that a lot of um, women, Haitian women, a lot of women in our culture, they don't go for something, not because they don't aspire to doing it or they don't dream of doing it, but because they don't go for it because of the fear yeah. of being alone. Yeah. Being alone, doing it, being the only person in all your friends who is pursuing a degree in computer science, being, being the only person in your friends, like on Saturday nights, when they're going to, you know, the Haitian bal. Mm -hmm. and That's a party, you all. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You go to, you know, they go to party. And mm -hmm. then instead of partying, I'm stuck. Well, I wouldn't say I'm stuck. I choose to be at a library. Yes. To study, because when I was going through college, I was working full time. Yep. So, um, in, in, and I feel that we hold ourselves back sometimes because of a fear that we're doing it. It's just us. We don't have any company. We, we don't have anybody that we know that um, makes us feel that validates what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, I, I know that it's important and I would urge any woman, a young girl listening to us right now, I would urge them to go for it because that is a sign, a sure sign that this is something that you need to be doing. When you start thinking, well, who else is doing that? Um, So-and-so is not going to be doing it with me. I'm the only person doing it. Um, I find myself the only person several times and it doesn't change. It doesn't change. It continues to happen. When I was going to um, BU, especially a technical, a technical field, 
I cannot count how many times I'm in a class. First of all, I had a name that's unique. I have a name that's unique. I understand. Okay. So, <laughs> exactly. So there's no escaping there. I'm yeah. the only Webby in the class. There's no uh -huh. other, there's no mistake. It's not like I'm Lacey or um, Gina or Lisa. I'm the only Webby. So they can't mistake that one. I'm the only Webby. But many times I was the only immigrant and the only African-American, I mean, the only black person mm -hmm. and the only woman. Yeah. Many times, many times. And we had to work in, in, we had to work in groups for project. Mm -hmm. But I don't think back then, this is not something that bothered me because I, I was focusing on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's something as immigrants that we we cherish we it, that's innate in us when we come here in this country we know what we didn't have growing up we know the opportunities that we didn't have so being the only woman being the only black person being the only immigrant that's not something that was top of mind for me at that time mm -hmm. because i was too amazed and blown away that oh my god i'm here i'm doing this this is it. This is my opportunity. And I wanted to grab as much as I can. I became a sponge. I wanted to have two brains because I'm like, I want to get as much as possible because this isn't the opportunity of a lifetime. So I think that being amazed at all the opportunities that we have here as immigrants, that's what keeps us focused. And that's what helps us turn off the noise, the noise of, um, you know, of problems with diversity, because a lot of the issues with diversity, I really learned about them living in the United States. So I didn't grow up yeah. with all of that, you know, racism. My first experience with racism was in the United States. And I'm loving that you touched on that, Webley, because mm -hmm. there is, I, I've said this before, um, being Haitian is an ethnicity right? Um, and being African-American is an ethnicity and they're two entirely different cultures. Yes. So I love that, um, that you say that. So when people ask me um, who I am or, or if what, you know, um, I am, I say that I am a black Haitian American woman. And so I specifically state that because um, people oftentimes say, oh, you're African American, that means black. But I'm like, no, it actually does not. Um, it's a different culture, different food, different languages, right? Um, and so this is something that as, as a Haitian American person and as a Haitian person, when we are thrust into um, the United States and, and all the cultural and socio economic norms that come along with living in the United States is very foreign, you know, even yes. if you are Haitian American raised here in the United States, at home, my mom used to always say, inside the house is the Republic of Haiti, outside is the United States of America. Oh, wow. And that's how she raised us. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I, as a person born and raised here, um, speak French and Creole. And, and I made it a priority because my parents made it a priority. My mom instilled that so deeply within. And I didn't even learn English till I was five. And I oh, thought, wow. yeah. And so, you know, I was an American living in the United States who did not speak English. Right. Well, and you know, this is something um, I'm so happy that you touched on that because um, you touched on the fact that, you know, being Haitian American is a culture mm -hmm. because I remember trying to identify or trying to relate to African Americans. It was difficult because at times, you know, I was seen as this immigrant mm -hmm. who left her country you know, you left your country to come here and take the, and take our jobs. There's only a few jobs available for people of color. Why do you want it? You know, I've had comments like, you know, you're so proper. And I'm like, oh, what, yeah. what, what, what does that mean? Well, you, you speak English so proper. And I'm like, well, what other English am I supposed to speak? Because this is the only one that I've learned. Right. It was so, so, exactly. So I didn't grow up, you know, speaking a different language. I grew up speaking French and Creole. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn English. So the only English I know is the one that I'm speaking. Well, you want to call it proper. Okay. But what does that say when you say that it's proper? Mm -hmm. Is it an acknowledgement that you are not speaking something that's proper? And when you acknowledge that, 
are you elevating yourself for greatness? When you putting that label on you, you don't speak proper, you don't do this, you don't. And I'm like, why would I want to put that label on myself? I, I don't want to put that label on myself. But you that's know? another so, cultural badge that someone is trying to. It is, on. it is. So, you know, it's like, I couldn't really fit anywhere. I couldn't, I, I didn't fit, you know, as an African-American right. and I didn't fit as an immigrant altogether. Mm -hmm. So those are all challenges that people don't realize as, Af as um, Haitian American that we deal with. Yes. And we come from a country where education is important. It is my, my dad didn't go to college. My dad didn't even finish high school, mm -hmm. but everything that I know about business I've learned from my dad because he was one of the hardest, he is one of the hardest working person that I'm like, somebody who never went to college, who didn't even finish high school. And he was able, he has his own business, never worked with a single person all his life. Wow. You that know, amazing. that's amazing. So I had these role models in my family, my dad as a businessman, a fierce businessman, and my mom as this, you know, cheerleader. Yeah, go for it. I don't know. I don't understand it, but I'll go for it. Right. So those things kept me grounded when I'm faced with those different challenges, you know, the culture clash um, here, you know, the whole um, race thing. And I'm like, oh my God, that's something else to deal with. But I think, you know, all culture, what we grew up with, it fuels us to always push and get as much as this opportunity as we can. And that was my focus the whole time. And it continues to be my focus. And I really love that because it's important, um, I think, for our listeners to understand that, that um, blackness, right, is not monolithic. And, it's, and this is not only for non-Black people to understand, this is important for Black people themselves to understand, especially here in the United States. Blackness is not seen as one experience. And the way that we experience racism varies greatly um, because in Haiti, I think colorism exists, but racism yes. does not, right? And in the United States, they have that, that double layer of colorism, racism, and, and many other things combined that that Haitian people themselves were not privy to, and not only Haitian people, but um, anyone that, that is honestly of the African diaspora that has come here to the United States or to this part of the world, right? So the way that, that we perceive ourselves is very different from the way that we are perceived. And so we're expected to, um, we're expected to respond in a way that, that is similar to our counterparts who are African American, but we don't have that cultural reference. That exactly, you know, exactly. Our cultural reference is so different. But Webley, don't even get me started on that. I think we may have to have a part two, Webley. But I want <laughs> you to talk about this for a moment because I want people to know the type of work that you do and, and why that type of work is so important. So um, we touched upon the obstacles for women in the tech industry um, through your personal experience, but tell me as a social media strategist, right? What do you bring to the game and why is it important to have a social media strategy in this diversity and inclusion age that, that we're, that we're um, going into? I feel like it is a golden age that we're coming upon, but we have to be careful with our social media, right? Um, in order exactly. to cultivate our, our image. So tell me why that's important. Well, that's important because there's a big shift, a big shift happening in the business world right now. Um, whereas it, it, it's almost as if, you have to innovate or you die. And again, we're back to technology. Um, a lot of businesses are shifting to the online world because you save money too. Um, you don't have to have a brick and mortar um, business. You don't have to make all those expenses. You don't have to have all those overhead that came with having a physical place to run your business. So a lot of things are being done online. And I see a lot of entrepreneur um, getting women entrepreneur getting into the online world. And, you know, they buy into a dream of, yes, you can get six figures. You can do this. You can do that. And a lot of time, reality strikes in, you know, they follow all the rules, they do everything, they launch their product or they launch that website and they sell into crickets. I, this is one thing I really love about you, Webley. You are <laughs> no sugarcoating, keeping it real, straight talk. And, and exactly. What I'm to is you talk about creating an ugly website. 
And I love that. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, so, you know, um, that ties into the importance of social media also, because we pay attention to everything pretty because perception is everything online. But it's a fine line also because you got to be careful that you're not projecting an image of you that you're trying to keep up with also. You know, this persona that you're projecting, you're trying to keep up or this persona you cannot deliver. So that's why I'm like, start with an ugly website. Start with an ugly website because when you're overthinking it, you're taking away from the gift that you have to offer to people. And social media is important in delivering your message and letting people getting to know you. And the, the best part about it is that the way you used to do marketing before where you had to pay to have a spread on a magazine, you had to pay to have you know, a little square on a newspaper that will cost you a lot of money, sometimes you know, $600 a week. You have platforms like Facebook and Instagram. Facebook alone has over 3 billion people around the world. So imagine you have this, your billboard. So your social media presence is the new billboard. So your billboard can be seen by someone in Africa, someone in Egypt, someone in India, someone in United Kingdom, someone in um, New Zealand. I mean, when you have that much opportunity and you are overthinking everything, you want everything to be great from the get-go, you missing out on reaching that one person who probably wants to know how to make an extra $100 a month yep. to pay the bills. You're missing out on the opportunity to reach that one person who's trying to figure out how to put their kids to sleep at night mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do. So that has nothing to do with a pretty website. It has everything to do with you, what you have to offer, how you want to serve. I wouldn't say your community, how you want to serve other people because online you have a whole different um, community around the world. So if you put your focus on how you can help people as opposed to everything's got to be pretty, I think you will do fine with an ugly website. Webley, you know what I, I want our listeners to see? This whole concept, and this is why I love the concept, your concept of launch an ugly website, because it relates directly to your entire journey, because you are going to launch whatever it is, whatever career that you planned on doing, regardless of what was expected, right? And that's what you proceeded to do. And then in the, in the process, you were able to help not only your community, our community, every community by simply being empowered and enabled, right? By, by being empowered to pursue a dream that you had a vague idea about, but you knew exactly. what you wanted, right? I feel like that was the ugly website story. I feel like this needs to be your signature talk. But, <laughs> Right. But then you were you were enabled, enabled in the best sense, enabled by by people who were willing to support you. Right. People said, all right, and support you with information so you can make the decision you needed to make. Right. And through that, you were able to do so much. And it's had a rippling effect. And this is what has brought you here today. And I feel like that that story, like I that whole concept of an ugly website that is really your whole journey. And that's what you're empowering people to do now in your business. So Webley, I want to thank you for being <laughs> on the Global Fluency Podcast. I've had so much fun and I know our <laughs> listeners are enjoying this. So please, before we go, tell everyone where they can find you. Well, they can find me at webleyalfred.com. Um, also on Facebook, everything is Webley Alfred, Facebook, LinkedIn. <laughs> Instagram, um, Instagram. <laughs> yeah, Pinterest, it's webleyalfred.com. Hey, so send me a message and say hi. I love receiving love notes <laughs> from people and, um, you know, and I, and I'm happy to serve. I don't like saying helping serve entrepreneurs and help them realize their dream or at least help them get some clarity on, you know, how many people are sitting there waiting for their gift. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. So everybody, thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Webley, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. 
Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And um, I really enjoy this conversation. I really enjoy um, um, how this is going to empower um, the listeners and how this is going to fuel so many people to just go for it. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So everyone, let's keep the conversation going. Tune into our next episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm Bertine Crevacore West, and it's been a pleasure being your host. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going.